Welcome, Lauren. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, and congratulations on Last Tang Standing. How exciting. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Zippy. Um, I'm really excited to be um, talking to, to you today, and um, yeah, I hope, I hope we'll have fun. You have the funniest um, about the author bio, you know, book jacket description uh, that I've like ever read. Um, I already read it on your bio here, but uh, you're so funny that when you say it's not based on your mother at all, seriously. Tell me about, <laughs> so tell me about how Last Hang Standing is not based on your mother. What's it based on then? And, and maybe you start by explaining what the book is about to people who haven't read it. Sure, sure. Um, so Last Hang Standing is, um, is a book about a 30-something-year-old um, lawyer a 30-something lawyer who's basically trying to climb the corporate ladder um, while, you know, fending off the uh, unhealthy interests her relatives have in her love life. So um, it's basically written in diary form, and it's set over the course of a year. And um, we're going to follow Andrea's journey. Andrea's the protagonist, you know, as she um, tries to find what she wants in life. So that's basically the, the story of the book. And um, when I say it's not based on my mom, it's because I'm legally obliged to say that. <laughs> but my mom knows. So no, I'm, I'm kidding. It's only like partially based on her, of course. <laughs> I have to say. This is being recorded. So. <laughs> um, so when you meet the main character in this book, she's facing the Chinese New Year, which I didn't even know was like the worst time ever for single women who were over 30 in the Chinese <laughs> culture community. Um, tell me a little more about that. And if like, did this happen to you or these are friends of yours this happened to or just tell me about where you started the book, how you entered it that way? Well, you know, I obviously I exaggerated certain aspects of the book for like comic relief. Um, but it is a terrible time for single people, uh, you know, Chinese New Year. Like, I suppose any clan gathering for, um, you know, people people with, uh, you know, uh, from cultures where family ties are still really important and you have a lot of clanic gatherings. Um, so, like, Chinese New Year is pretty much, like, the worst for um, singletons that are above 30 and, like, who are of, like, Chinese background. Um, I didn't go through this, thankfully, because I got married pretty young. I got married when I was like 27. And not because I was afraid of the clan gathering, I must, I must stress. I don't know. I think but, you're protesting too much, you know. I, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I buy it, but okay, fine. But, uh, but I had many friends who had gone through similar things, and they told me, like, you know, they always dreaded Chinese New Year because, like, people get extra drunk and extra, extra, you know, uh, Pray. That's not even a word. But yeah, like, like you know, they get yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and where are you, by the way? You're in. Are you in Singapore now, or where are you calling from? Um, actually, I'm in Malaysia, which is you know in the same time zone as Singapore, and um, I'm currently based there because my husband's work um, requires him to be there. But we might move back to Singapore. I don't know. I'm kind of in between places. It's weird because. I am from Malaysia, but I haven't been, I haven't been living in Malaysia for like, I hadn't been living in Malaysia for over a decade, more than that, before I moved back. So, yes, it's strange. And so are you in closer proximity to your mother now? Oh, no. She's in a different state with my dad. Oh, okay. I think we're trying to. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Actually, they moved to um, a, like a state closer to Singapore when I had a kid, and um, they 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 would do the crossing, like they would cross the straits um, to see me. But then we moved to Malaysia, and they're like, "Oh, uh, you're you're in Kuala Lumpur now," and that's like not what we were expecting. But now they have this house in in Johor, which is the state which is closest to Singapore, and they're like, "Oh, that's." That's not working out the way I thought it would. But you know, <laughs> some way through life, right? That's an important lesson for my mom to learn. Um, so tell me about your decision to write this book at all. Like what made you want to write a book or this book in particular? Um, well, I have, 
I have been writing competitively. I, I call it competitive writing uh, for some time. Uh, so I used to write short stories and submit them for competitions. And, and like some of them have been published. And um, I always had in mind that I wanted to write like a, a novel, but I never really had the time because back then I used to be a legal counsel and I was always like working really long hours. And so um, when we moved to Singapore about six years ago, um, I finally had the time to sit down and like I had the, like the bandwidth to um, write. And um, so at the same time, I was also trying out stand-up comedy as like an amateur. And so this was like the time for me to, to kind of like experiment creatively. And so I got the idea for the book um, during a stand-up comedy set about conditional versus unconditional love and Asian parents. So that's how I got the idea for the book and it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. So funny. And I saw actually you're in conversation soon with uh, Kevin Kwan and I interviewed him yesterday. <laughs> Great. I mean, I'm so excited about it. I, I'm, yeah, I, I try not to think about it because I might not be able to like sleep at night if I do. So... <laughs> I'm just trying, trying to think about it. And, do, yeah. Do you watch um, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel? Have you ever seen um, that show about the stand-up yeah. Jewish comedian back in the, I don't know when it was, the 50s probably? Um, and she, you know, Midge Maisel decides to not be a housewife anymore and just, you know, take over the world and go do stand-up comic everywhere. And um, anyway, you should watch it. It's uh, it's really funny and really good. Or maybe you yeah, should just make your own version of a show like that. <laughs> no, I don't think I would be a... I, I don't know. I I wouldn't know where to start. I, I don't think I would be a good actor or scriptwriter. So we'll see. I don't know. You, pulled, yeah. off, you pulled off um, this book, so... <laughs> we will see. Um, tell me more about uh, the process of writing your book. So you, you thought of the idea during stand-up, and then what happened? And then I did um, the adult thing of like setting aside some time every day and writing um, a little bit every day. Um, you know, when I was in my 20s, I used to think like, you know, um, writing would just be like, oh, the muse has, has overcome. Uh, I, I mean, the muse has struck and I'm going to sit down and like write something. But um, I actually got pretty good advice from my friends who told me like, if you want to finish a novel, you need to to sit down for like a certain hour, like a certain number of hours a day and just like write the novel. And that's what I did. And that's the only reason I managed to finish uh, the novel. Yeah. So discipline. And I, I might have forgotten the question. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, no, that's fine. I just wanted to know about your journey, you know, to writing it. Um, did you have the whole thing plotted out in your head? Did you know the way you wanted it to go when you sat down to write it? Or did it all just come tumbling out once you... Once your fingers hit the keyboard. No, I um so the first draft I ever did, um, which I thought was good enough and which I submitted out to agents, obviously was not good enough because I didn't I got like some requests for like full manuscript but um no actual bites in the end. But yeah, so like the first draft was not so good and it was just something that I I had like the barest grasp on plotting and I just thought this is the way it should go, blah, blah, blah. And But after I got those rejections, I kind of sat down and I like, read a couple, no, more than a couple of craft books. And I learned how to plot by reading these books. And yeah, so I I read, read jig maybe 30% of the book and like added another 20%. And all these stats make me sound much more intelligent than I probably am. But yeah, that's how... That's the version that actually got me an agent and actually was sold uh, came about. But yeah, I, it has gone through a lot of redrafting. Yeah. I kind of like, once I knew what I was doing, I was like, oh no, I should add this idea in, and I should add this scene in. And my editor was like, give me the damn manuscript. <laughs> no, she didn't say, give me the manuscript. The deadline's here. So, and yeah. 
Um, there's a, it reminds me a little of Bridget Jones's diary and the whole diaristic format of the book and having like little entries and, you know, next to different times and what you were thinking or not you, sorry, what your character is thinking, um, as she goes through it. Did you model it on, on books like that? Or did you have any inspiration from other books or did you just like go at it the way you had in mind? Um, so I had, I, I, I had always known that I would write the book in diary form. So what I did was before I started writing, I started reading up all the uh, diary books I had. So like Richard Jones diaries, um, like I had two or three of the books and I read them all. And then I read like Adrian Moe diaries. I think I read like two or three as well from the series. And, um, I loved the Adrian yeah. Mole Diaries, by the way. Those were like, yeah. nobody talks about them anymore. I still have one from when I was little. Like, those were fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, They're so good, right? And I just basically read them and, like, oh, I figured out how, I would, like, you know, I just need a refresher as to how, like, a diary form novel could be. And I just kind of, like, did my own thing. Um, I probably put in more traditional traditional narrative structure I, I, sorry, I, I probably spliced in more traditional narrative chunks than like Bridget Jones and Diary did or Adrian Mole, but yeah, so it's like a, a mixture of, I did my own thing, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that answered my question. Um, so start to finish, how long do you think the whole project took you? Um... I finished the first draft in 2017, and I spent 2018 redrafting, and I got my agent in 2019. So I think the whole process probably took like three and a half years. Yeah. Uh, publishing is like, takes such a long time, right? It's not like, it's not for someone who has very short attention span or like very little patience, because the turnover for one project takes forever. And it's not even like you, you have no control over it. You just basically have to just relinquish control and let your publishers do their thing. And that can take a year and a half to two years. And people don't know that. So, yeah. yeah. It's slow. <laughs> That's why sometimes I like yeah. writing essays that you can post yourself like immediately. <laughs> like 800 words and then it's up. <laughs> and then you can post it and spread the word. So I don't know. I'm exactly. too imp- I feel like I'm too impatient for a lot of things. <laughs> Um, are you working on a new book or what's coming next for you? Um, so I'm working on the sequel that will hopefully be sold. I actually don't have a second book deal yet. So I'm like waiting for myself to finish. I'm waiting to finish the book and then see how it goes and then actually sell the second book, I hope. Um, but yeah, I'm working on a sequel. Maybe TMI. I'm no, working on not, too, not TMI. That's uh, <laughs> um, and I saw on Instagram how you took your daughter and you're like staking out different bookstores now that you can be out of the house and look around and all that. Tell me about what that feeling was like seeing your book on a shelf. Oh, it was great. Um, yeah, I, I I can't even describe the feeling. It's like a it's like dread mixed with anticipation mixed with I don't know too ma- too many drinks and. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's, I, I was just, the first time I saw my book on a shelf and it was in Kino Kunia in Malaysia, I was just so overcome with emotion because I, it was like Kino Kunia. In Kino Kunia, it's like the Waterstones, if you wish, or Barnes and Noble of Malaysia and Singapore. And well, they're kind of like everywhere in the region. So they're, they're kind of like a big deal. And, you know, I'm Malaysian. So seeing my book in the Kino Kunia store in KLCC was a big deal for me. But uh, I kind of want to see this, the book in person in Singapore because that's where I wrote the book. And this, that's where I was when I had like my stand-up comedy stint for two years. So I kind of want to be there to see the books. And I'm hoping that the borders open and we can like travel soon. I'm hoping. Yep. Yeah. This year, this year has been a tough year to be a baby. I won't kid, I won't kid around. It's been a tough year, but yeah, you know, it's hard. I know it's. I I have just just had such an outpouring of sort of, I don't know, empathy and trying to. I just feel so bad for people 
like you who have done all, all the work and done everything right and then it comes out and the environment is just like not what you expected and um you know the, the work is still the work hasn't changed it's just everything else in the entire universe so um i don't know i have a lot of compassion for trying to get the word out about um great debut books like yours so um yeah thank you so my my heart goes out to you and all your peers and <laughs> you know it's tough um but not impossible right i mean look at you you're standing out already so it's great not impossible i i think like the thing that most authors want is you know, that in-store event, right, where they can, like, sign the books and meet fans or haters. Uh, but you want to meet the people who've read your book in person, right? Because there's still something special about meeting people in person because they're social animals. And it's not the same, like, signing a stack of books and having, like, the bookstores mail them out, which is what I've done for a few of the indies in Kuala Lumpur, where I'm based. And it's just not the same because you don't get you don't get to meet your your readers. And well, I'm hoping that this will change, but and it it looks like it might change soon. So I'm still crossing my fingers. Yeah, but you know, you know, I'm really happy that I've managed to meet so many interesting people to like virtual events, like you, <laughs> like you. Oh gosh, this would have never happened if not for like the C word. And so, you know, I, I take pleasure in, like, these unexpected serendipitous events. <gasps> and I'm going to meet Kevin, I mean, not me, but I'm going to meet Kevin Kwan. So, you know what I mean? Like, they're good and bad things, you know? So, yeah. I, I do like that the physical boundaries separating people are gone, just you know, I was like, what am I doing today? Oh, I'm going to bring somebody in Malaysia and then an hour later in London and then an hour later in Nigeria. Like, that is so cool. I, w I mean, I never would have had that before. It wouldn't have been, you know, on the menu of options. So, yeah, that is a huge benefit that, you know, physical boundaries no longer should prohibit any communication. Not that they did, but now at least it's like in my face that it's so easy. <laughs> so, um, you have like a really professional looking mic. Thank you. you know, yes, I love my mic. I got it on Amazon. Um, it's called, it's a Blue Yeti microphone. I Googled best microphones for podcasts a couple of years ago, and this is what came up. And so I am a huge fan. Um, yes. Now my son has stolen one and is using it upstairs to play video games. Um, some of his friends think he's the coolest. But <laughs> uh, anyway, um, thank you, though. <laughs> um, so do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Yes. Um, sit your butt down and finish the manuscript because that's the only way you get any work. Like you, that's the only way you have anything to present to anyone. So sit down, finish your manuscript, and start getting other people's opinions on it. But not too many. Like gentle but firm readers. Does that exist? Yes, but yeah. So you need people to look through your work and tell you if it's good or bad. But finish your work first. Is there anyone yeah. you wish you hadn't shown your work to? Mm, not really. I, I kind of wish I'd shown my sister the, um, the second or third draft I did because the first draft she was like not very impressed, and she's read a lot of my stuff and she's like, "Oh, this is not going to go very far." And she was right; it didn't really go very far. So I, I wish I'd shown her the second or third manuscript. Mm, so yeah, it's more like a regret. Not really. I wish I hadn't shown someone this, but yeah. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, Lauren. Thanks for coming on Moms No Time to Read Books. Thanks for talking about your whole experience. Thanks for bridging this sort of international borders of us uh, getting to chit chat today um, and all the rest. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And I hope you enjoy your, um, your other two uh, interviews in London, was it? In Nigeria? Yeah. Wow, that, that's pretty intense. Um, yeah, good, good luck and uh, take good care of your voice. I feel like you might need that. Oh, no. Right? I don't know. I, I've honed it from years of screaming at my children, so it's, it's fine now. <laughs> it never gets tired. <laughs> uh, well, but maybe one day we can, uh, we can finally meet in person if you ever get to New York. or I don't know if I have maybe. any plans to go to Kuala Lumpur, but you never know. Life is crazy. so. so I, I think it's more likely that I'll be in New York one day than the opposite but um i have a tip like if you ever need um something to lubricate your throat like um 
apple cider vinegar, warm apple cider vinegar with like a dollop of honey is really good for your throat. Like I've used this for my my voice is going a little bit. I don't know if you can hear this, but it's because like I've done a couple of interviews today, and um yeah, but like honey is so good. Hmm. Yeah. My my husband has like jars and jars of apple cider vinegar in the fridge. He's all about that like turmeric and apple cider vinegar. We have so many. We're like a homeopathy store here. Um, but thank you. Yes, I, he's, he's always trying to get me to do that, and I usually don't. So thank you <laughs> for the reminder. I appreciate it. It was <laughs> um, so good to talk to you. It was so good uh, to talk I, to you, too. Okay, have a really good afternoon, morning. Morning. Yes, still morning here. You, too. Have a good night. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Bye. Lauren. Take care. Bye-bye.